God. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to take them and turn to Romans chapter number 9. Romans chapter 9. And if you're visiting with us this morning, we have been working our way through the book of Romans now since, I believe, July of last year. And my goal when we started was to be done by the end of 2015. And if you uh, look in your Bible, you notice there's 16 chapters and we're on chapter 9. So it didn't work out according to plan. But we hope to be done by the one-year anniversary of Romans 9, our, the book of Romans. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, Romans chapter 9 is probably the most difficult passage in the entire Bible to understand. Um, there's so many controversies, so many different forms of... Uh, with even within Christianity of beliefs that spring forward from this passage of scripture and uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were here right before the snowstorm that Sunday before uh, we tackled Romans chapter 9 the latter part of that chapter and we're going to begin this morning looking at verse number one and we're going to go through verse number six so kind of work our way backwards a little bit if you'd like to hear the first part I believe that's up on our website you can go back and you can listen to the the, the first message that we pe- preached here from Romans chapter 9 Um, But when we began this message last time we were together, we started by looking at the major problem that was facing the nation of Israel. And they felt that they were owed something by God because of, of a national birthright, so to speak. They were born into this Jewish heritage, into this family, and so they thought, well, because I am a Jew that I am entitled to certain spiritual benefits And God says, no, in Christ, there's no Jew, there's no Greek, there's no Gentile. They're they're all the same in God. But that's what Paul is addressing here in Romans chapter 9. And so the question that we see here in this text, if God rejects you because you rejected him, is God unrighteous? And Paul answers that question in a very resounding, no, absolutely not. God forbid, there is no unrighteousness in God. But this passage of scripture is not just about those who have rejected God and those who have been accepted by God. Today I want you to notice in Romans chapter 9 that the Apostle Paul had a genuine passion for the people of Israel. He loved these people with all of his heart. You say, well that's because he was Jewish in his background. Well, that could be part of the reason why. But if you remember Paul, he was every single turn in his ministry He was beaten by the Jews, he was arrested by the Jews, he was thwarted by the Jews, his life was threatened by the Jews, and ultimately the Jews were the one that that ended up shipping him off to Rome because they didn't want to deal with the problem there. They made Rome get rid of him, take him out. They extradited him out of the nation of Israel because they didn't want to deal with him anymore. He was too big of a problem. Yet in spite of all of that, Paul still loved his native people. Ladies and gentlemen, can I say this this morning? I have never been spat upon for the gospel. I have never been beaten. I have never been put in prison. I have never been persecuted for being a Christian. And if I had gone through all the things that the Apostle Paul had gone through in his ministry, I don't know that I would be able to have the same attitude that Paul had towards those people that were opposing the work that he was trying to do for God. But we're going to see here in Romans chapter 9 this morning that Paul had a genuine passion for the people of Israel. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse number 1, and we'll read the first three verses together, and then we'll pray, and we'll get into the Word of God. The Bible says, or Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Let's pray together. Father, As we dig into your word this morning, I pray that you would help us to see what you have for us. Lord, each individual person here is a soul that's going to spend eternity somewhere, either heaven or hell, and I pray today, by the time we walk out of this room, that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt where we're going to be. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have a passion for people around us who need you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have you ever heard the expression, people don't care how much you know, until they know how much you what? Until you care, right? There's a lot of people that I have met that are very knowledgeable, but they're very proud, they're very arrogant. You want nothing to do with them from the moment you walk into the room, right? Because the way they carry themselves, they say, I am holier than thou, or I am smarter than you, and I am better than you. And they might be all of those things, but they, they really don't. You can tell by the way they live their life that they don't care about you. Have you ever said to your kids, 
I know this is going to hurt you, but it's going to hurt you when you're disciplining them. It's going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt me. How many of your parents ever said that to you growing up? How many of you parents said that to you? You knew they were lying, right? And my, my parents were, absolutely. But the idea that you're trying to communicate there is, I really, really care about you. Well, how does Paul appeal to the nation of Israel? You see, he, he could have just simply said, okay, here's doctrine, here's truth. Take it or leave it. If you don't take it, you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn for all of eternity. Paul could have said that as an apostle. He had the power and the authority of God to say that, but he didn't. He appealed to them. He says, if there's any other way for you to go to heaven, if, if I could be accursed myself and go to hell so that way the nation of Israel could go to heaven, I would be willing to make my sa that sacrifice. Hey, Faithway family, think for a second. Is there anyone here in this room that you would be willing to die for so they could go to heaven so, and, and switch places and you go to hell? You think about that. The love and the passion that Paul had for the nation of Israel. Who was Paul's example? Well, has there ever been anyone in the Bible that Paul was looking at as a great example to follow in the history of the world? Has there ever been anyone who said, I will be accursed for you so you can have a right standing with God? Absolutely, Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Everywhere that Paul went, he was mocked, he was insulted, he was cursed, he was beaten primarily by the people of Israel. The same people that beat Paul would have been the same people that pulled the beard out of Jesus' face. They would have been the same people that mocked him and jeered him as he walked up Golgotha's road. He, they would have been the same people that said, crucify him, crucify him. And isn't it interesting that this Saul, before he was saved, who was so interested in, opposed to, in opposing Christianity, who so maliciously tried to destroy the gospel, Jesus now says that he now says, because this gospel is true, I wish myself accursed so that way you could have the gospel. Listen, Paul was beaten like Christ was beaten. Paul was ultimately executed like Christ was executed. And Paul was willing to be accursed like Christ was cursed for us. What do we see in the first three verses of Romans chapter 9? We see that Paul has a passion in his heart for the souls of men. Now, I wonder about you in, my, in your life, in my life. I, I asked myself the same question this morning. Do I have a genuine passion for the people around me that are dying and going to hell? Would I be willing to accurse myself if it were possible, and it's not, but would I be willing to do that so others could go to heaven? You know, sometimes we think that in America, you know, it's, it's just so hard, it's so difficult to tell people about the Lord. Listen, if you're saved today, we make it very easy for you. On the way out the door this morning, we have what we call our track rack, our gospel track rack, and we have probably a dozen different uh, gospel tracks that you can take and you can hand out to someone and you can say, hey, I'd like to give you a little bit more information about the Lord Jesus Christ or I'd like to invite you to our church. It's really easy to give someone a gospel track, but I've got to tell you, there are times that I err on the side of being shy. But we have so many different places and opportunities in our life. God has given us fishing holes, so to speak, where we can talk to people about the Lord. Several weeks ago, I was at my favorite coffee shop here in Leesburg. Well, I got lots of favorite coffee shops. But I was at one of my favorite coffee shops here in Leesburg, and no one else was in there. And I, I got a large coffee to go, and there, there's a guy that I've been witnessing to for a while, just talking to him on and off about going to church, and he doesn't go to church anywhere. Invited him out a couple of times, just verbally. And as I got my coffee, I didn't say anything to, to him about the Lord or church that day. And I'm walking out the door, the place is empty, and the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, you know, you need to give this guy an invitation to church. And I started arguing with God. No, Lord, I'm late to, a, I got an appointment, I got to go somewhere, I, I don't want to do it, what's he going to think? And I had this wrestling match for maybe a split second with God in my mind. Should I do it or should I not do it? And I went back out to the car, I got one of our Faithway gospel invitations, and I walked back inside the store and I said to him, hey man, I'd like to, I'm a pastor of the church, as you know, and I'd like to invite you to our church services sometime. And you know, sometimes when we hand someone a gospel track, we think, well, what they're going to do is they're going to rip it up, right? <laughs> they're they're going to hide it, they're going to throw it in the trash can, they're going to make fun of us. But he was very gracious and he received it and said, thank you so much, I'd love to do that sometime. 
I, I've never been spat upon for giving someone a gospel track. Maybe you have, but most of the time people are so gracious, and yet we fear persecution, but we face nothing like the Apostle Paul did. I have found that people are very pleasant when you try to invite them to church and share the gospel. And what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 9 is, he says, listen, I love Jesus so much, it has changed my life. If there's any way that the nation of Israel could just grasp this, I would be willing to go to hell for them. Have you ever been thrown in prison? I haven't. Have you ever been mocked for your faith? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But Paul loved these people so much that he was willing to let himself be accursed for the sake of of another soul do you have someone like that that you are passionately praying about to come to christ it's no wonder that paul like jesus christ was such a passionate soul winner if you want to use that word he went after people and he told people about christ because he had a legitimate passion for the people of for people to come to know god jesus christ as their savior on wednesday nights we meet together for a time of bible study and prayer we take about a half an hour and we just pray together as a church family and there's a section there on our prayer sheet every week that you have an opportunity to give us some people that we can pray for in your life, coworkers, family members, whoever they might be that need to know Jesus Christ. And you know, that, that section should not be sparse. There should be people in our lives that we are praying for on a continual basis that they would get saved. And if you don't know anyone, or if you don't, maybe you're not praying for someone right now, can I just encourage you? Pray in your heart, Lord. Give me someone that I can pray for every single day that they would get saved. Lord, I have family members that aren't saved. I, I want to share the gospel with them so that way their salvation is secure before they, go to before they die so they can go to heaven one day. It's no wonder that Paul was such an effective preacher because he was passionate about the lives of other people. He knew that God used men, he used women, he used people to spread the gospel. If you ever think, if you ever thought about this, God, the word we use in the Bible, theological word, is omnipotent, right? You break it down, omni means all, nipotent is power, all-powerful, God is all-powerful. And God being all-powerful, if, if the gospel is true, he could have used the angels of heaven to, to spread the gospel. He could have forced every single human being, like a robot, to trust his son as his savior, but he left the important message of spreading the gospel, of delineating the good news of Jesus Christ to us as human beings. We have the distinct privilege of being the ambassadors of Jesus Christ, the ambassador of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and that is our job. And so when you turn to Romans chapter 9 and you look at this text, this is a challenging passage to the Jewish people. But before Paul gets to this difficult message, he says, listen, brothers and sisters of uh, uh, where you came from, my, my blood, my, my heritage. He says, I have a message that I want you to hear. I love you so much, and I long for you to go to heaven so much that I would be willing to trade places with you and go to hell. Are you excited that God uses people like you and like me to bring other people to himself? There was an article that I read in a uh, magazine one time. A lady by the name of Jean Fleming wrote this article about an incident that took place in her church. And, and her pastor from the pulpit said, so, said on a Sunday morning, he said, I got some exciting news to share with our church family. He said, there's a, a little elementary school age boy by the name of Crockett. And he said, I got some news about Crockett this week. Crockett prayed and trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. And there was another boy about the same age as Crockett. All of a sudden, from the back of the auditorium, he let out a little yell, Yay for Crockett! And the mom looked around, obviously, with that little boy, and she was embarrassed. But the pastor echoed the sentiment of that little boy, and he said, Yay for Crockett! And all the people of the church echoed, Yay for Crockett! Why? Because they were excited that this young boy got saved. And this five- or six-year-old kid, hey, he didn't have any, you know, he, he didn't have any lid on it. He, he didn't know it was appropriate or not. He just let it rip. I'm so excited that my buddy is going to be in heaven one day with me. You know, whenever we have a baptism service, um, many times after someone comes up out of the water, we, we applaud and we clap. We're not clapping for them because they came up out of the water, right? That's not the reason we're clapping for them. We're not clapping for them because, you know, they're some famous person or whatever. We're clapping for them because what they are doing is they are saying, I have decided to follow Jesus, and we're essentially saying, yay for Crockett, right? We're behind you. We follow you. We're passionate about what you are doing. And with Ryan and Amanda this morning, when they dedicated little Jack to the Lord, 
That's what we're as a church family behind. We're saying, okay, we're going to help you and hold you accountable, and we're going, to, uh, we're going to pray for you as you raise your son in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Hey, does little five- or six-year-old Crockett, does he understand the, the depth of Romans chapter 8 and Romans 9? Has he gone to theological seminary and studied all the ins and the outs of the gospel? No. But a five-year-old boy can understand that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And you know what a little five-year-old boy can do for another little five-year-old boy? He can shout out, yay for Crockett. Why? Because the gospel is so simple. There's something spontaneously exciting about someone coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And that's what you get from Paul. Paul says, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. And this unspeakable gift that Paul wants to share with Israel, he says, there's no way that I can put into words what Christ has done for me so I want you to experience it for yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, if Christ has truly saved your soul, but Christianity means little to you, in other words, if Christ is not daily directing your life, then I got news for you that you probably already know. You this morning are of all men most miserable. You know why? Because you're saved from hell, but you're living your life how you want to live, and you, the Bible says you can't serve two masters you got competing influences on your life. And it's so sad when I see a Christian living their life that way because the Bible says that Jesus came into this world that we might have life, eternal life, yes, but that we might have life here and now more abundantly. He wants to fill you with His Spirit and He wants to use you to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Satan is called the great deceiver. And you know what Satan does? He walks around and he tells our teenagers, he tells our young adults, he tells mom and dad, he says to grandma and grandpa, he says, you know, freedom is not found in the Bible. Freedom is not found in living your life according to what God says. Freedom is found in the world. But true freedom, ladies and gentlemen, is found in complete surrender to Jesus Christ. You will never, ever have greater freedom or greater joy and purpose, even in the midst of the hardest days of your life, when your life is completely surrendered to him. My own testimony is to the, of that fact. As I mentioned a few moments ago, my wife has been sick now for oh, three to four years, and it's been some very, very difficult days. Sometimes even our church family isn't really aware of some of the things that have gone on. Just Liz has been many times not even able to get out of bed during the day. And when she comes to church, it's very, very difficult on her. And she would shoot me for saying this this morning, so she's not here, so please don't say anything like that to her. But anyways, I say all that to say there have been some very difficult days. And I know some of you have gone through similar things like that in your life. And God has humbled you, and whether you're a caretaker or you've been someone who's been sick like that, you understand, I think, a little bit more having gone through that, what what it is like, someone that is chronically ill. And when you go through difficult days, there are times that I look at when I'm not walking with God like I should, and I get upset at God. And I say, Lord, do you remember what it was like when we started our church and we had, you know, people over our house on Wednesday night and Sunday night all the time and when we were able to do a lot things a lot more things and be more actively involved and when it just seems like Lord like life is falling apart and when it seems like life is falling apart that's when God says okay I need you to be still and know that I am God and when God gets a hold of your heart when he gets a hold of my heart and I see once again him high and lifted up like Isaiah said And I realize that he is on the throne and in spite of everything that he has a great plan for my life and all things work together for good to them that love God, that's when your faith becomes real. And ladies and gentlemen, people all around us need the grace of God and that is the burden that we see that Paul had here in this chapter. What do we see in this incredible chapter? Well, we see the general problem facing Israel. We saw that three weeks ago. And then we see the passion that Paul had for the nation of Israel. But in the few moments that we have left this morning, can I close with the glorious provision that God has given to the nation of Israel? Would you look at verse number four? The Bible says, Who are the Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises who are the fathers and of, the, as, uh, and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Now, if you noticed in verses 4 and 5, Paul begins to list many of the blessings that God gave specifically his people. Look at verse 4 again. To whom are pertaining the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, 
promises? I mean, there are so many things that God has done for the nation of Israel, and he points it out here in this text. By the way, there is something that is really neat here in verse number 4. If you write in your Bible or underline or mark, I did in my Bible, I circled the word at the end of verse number 4. See, see the, the, the end of verse number 4, it says the service of God. Circle the word God, and then you've got to back up, and, and you've got to see to whom that, that word pertains. And, 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 it, and it pertains there, uh, the word pertaineth to whom, it, 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 who is God, which refers to that. And, and then if you back up a little bit more, who is it talking about? Well, it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Paul is saying is, God is Christ, who is God, who is blessed forever. I'm sorry, I said verse number four, I'm talking about verse number five. God is blessed forever. Who is God? It's Jesus Christ. God is Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is, is God. I was talking to a man this past week. Um, his wife was at the same clinic that Liz is at. And um, when she's going through treatment, there's not a lot for us to do sometimes. And so I was sitting there in the kitchen working on my laptop, kind of working on the message for today a little bit and, and kind of carrying on conversations with different people who were there. And there, there was one man I started talking to him about just about life in general. And it was very evident that he was part of a cult. And I was talking to him about theology, and I asked him, I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? He said, oh, absolutely, yes. I said, do you believe that Jesus is the only way that you can be saved? He said, yes. I said, do you believe that Jesus came to redeem mankind? And he said, yes. But then I threw a clincher at him, and I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God? And he said, no, no, we don't. Ladies and gentlemen, if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is God, he either is who he says he is, or he has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. Many p- people believe that Jesus came from God, that he's the son of God, that they, but they don't believe that he is God. And so when you read this text, you see very clearly that Jesus Christ is God. Just for fun, would you turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1? I think this is probably the greatest text in all of God's word, proof text, that Jesus, God the Father, God the Son are, are the same. Hebrews chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse number 8. Who is Jesus Christ? Hebrews 1.8 says, But unto the Son he saith, Who is he? God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Who is Jesus Christ? He is God who sits on the throne of, of heaven forever and ever. Jesus Christ is the very God. Why did Jesus have to be God? Well, why couldn't he have been a lesser being? Why couldn't he have been some sort of sub-God? Why does he have to be God? The answer is because God can only be pleased with God. A lesser sacrifice would not please him. Then why, does, why did Jesus have to be man? Because man sinned, and the penalty for sin had to be paid for by man. And so the fact that Jesus was 100% God on one hand, and on the other side of the equation he was 100% God, 100% man, 100% God, I'll never be able to reconcile those two things in my mind this side of heaven but it's the truth that the Bible teaches that we believe by faith. So what did God do for the people of Israel? You know what he did? Romans chapter 9, verse 4, he gave them promises. He provided for them. Isaiah chapter number 5, God says, Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his garden. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it. And also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. God says, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and the vineyard. What did God do for Israel? Well, in Isaiah chapter 5, he uses a parable and illustration. He says, I built you a vineyard. And not only did I build you a vineyard, I built a fence around that vineyard. And then I removed the stones from the ground and so those vines could grow up properly. I gave you the best vines, the choice vines, the ones that would produce the most fruit. Not only that, but in the middle of the garden, I built a tower. And from that tower, there was a defense going out that no one could harm you. And what God is saying to Israel was, look, I protected you, I provided for you, and now all that I want you to do is bear fruit. And God says, you got to choose between me or the wild vines? Which one is it going to be? In John chapter 15, Jesus carries that illustration over and he says to his, just says to his followers, he says, I, I want you to bear fruit. Then he says, I want you to bear much fruit. And then he says, I want you to bear more fruit. I want you to be fruitful in your life and in your ministry. So 
Is it reasonable to expect Christians to be fruit-bearing Christians? Yes or no? Absolutely. Is it a responsibility and a requirement to take the gospel into all the world? Yes, it is. David, King David knew what it was like to have the abundant provision of God. God gave him everything. And in spite of God giving him everything, David still sinned against God. Remember uh, the, the, the prophet Nathan went in and he pointed the finger at David and he said, Thou art the man. After all God had done for David, David still sinned against God. The problem was not the provision. The problem was the person. It was David. Lord, I would serve you, but, but you haven't done as much for me as you've done for somebody else. Have you ever felt maybe a little bit jealous when someone gets a blessing that you don't get? Maybe it just bugs you a little bit because God does something special for someone else. And you say, really God? You know, why don't you ever bless me like that? What have you done for me lately? Not enough. Oh, really? Oh, the precious blood that flowed from Calvary that flows from the side of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're saved this morning, Jesus Christ has done for you exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think. He's given you a home in heaven. What more do you need to serve him? In Germany, there was a pastor back in the 19, I'm sorry, 1940s, in the 1490s, reversed those two things. His name was Martin Rinkhart, and he was a German pastor during the Thirty Years' War. And there was a great plague during that time that, that went through most of Germany, and especially his village and his town that, that, that basically decimated the whole population. In his town, there were four churches, okay? Of the four churches, two of the pastors died, and one of the pastors in the middle of the night just got up and left to, to go to a fairer country, is what, uh, what, what the story goes. And he couldn't be convinced to come back home, so he just got out of town because of the plague. And so Martin Reinhardt was left there in this town of 50,000 people, roughly, and he was the only pastor. They, they say that upwards of 5,000 people died during this plague, and, and there were times that he was doing 40 to 50 services a day, funeral services for people who died during this plague. During this time, he was the only pastor in town. And as the plague progressed, he, he ended up doing the, the funeral for even his own wife. And towards the latter part of the plague, when people were getting discouraged and one out of ten people were dead because of this disease that had wiped through this village and this war that was continually going on, uh, Martin Wright, he got his children together after their mother had passed away. And he said to his children, I don't want you to get bitter towards God. I want you to love God, and I want you to serve God with your life. And he said, tonight I'm going to write you a prayer that I want you to pray to God every single day of your life. And the prayer that he went, went like this. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices, who wondrous things hath done, and whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms hath led us on our way with countless gifts of love, and still is ours today. This man, who at this time when he penned this, had done 5,000 funerals, including that of his own wife, he still knew what it was like to thank God for his unspeakable gift. Do you know what else he knew? He knew that if I have Jesus Christ, then nothing else in this life really matters. Because when I have Christ, I have it all. What did God do for the people of Israel? Beloved, God provided for them the most amazing gift, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the passion that Paul had. It was a glorious provision that God provided for his people. How did he provide it? He provided it by providing himself. And I think this morning that many of us are so busy with our day-to-day -day lives, looking at the blessings that other people get, and trying to live to, so that way we can get those same things and accomplish what they've accomplished, and keeping up with the Joneses that we forget to recognize and thank God for his unspeakable gift, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this morning, can I just encourage you? I know it's not the month of Thanksgiving, but can I encourage you to have a thankful heart towards God and thank him for what he has done for us by giving us himself, Jesus Christ. Because if you have Christ, you have everything. But if you're here this morning and you don't have Jesus Christ, then you have nothing. Oh, you may accumulate a large bank account, and you may live in a nice house and have a nice car, but at the, end of the, at the end of the days, there will be nothing left. When I was a boy growing up, I was a huge baseball fan. And in spite of the fact that I'm a Yankee fan, my favorite baseball player of all time 
is number nine of the Red Sox, Teddy Williams. I, I love Ted Williams, just watching highlight films of him. He was my dad's favorite player, even though he was a Yankee fan. And, and Ted Williams was a, a, a hero of mine, uh, the lady in our church where I grew up. She was Ted Williams' nurse for many years, and so she would get us autographs from time to time. And, and so he was just kind of a, a, a favorite favorite uh, player of mine, someone that I wanted to emulate in my baseball days, and obviously I didn't work out too well because I'm preaching this morning not playing baseball, uh, but he was one of my baseball heroes, so to speak. And you know, when we were last week in Arizona, I drove past a, a lab that said cryogenics on it, Al- Alcor Cryogenics, and, and something in the back of my mind stirred, because in 2001 or 2002, when Ted Williams passed away, He, in his last will and testament, requested that his body be cryogenically frozen for infinity, so to speak. And I Googled it, and sure enough, that building there, that nondescript warehouse building that we passed, was the the very place that Ted Williams is now frozen at negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit in a, a vat of, what is it, not hydrogen, in a vat of liquid nitrogen. And the reason behind that was a desire to live forever, to live in immortality. Ted Williams, he he didn't believe in God. In fact, he very famously said he didn't believe in God. And so unless on his deathbed he changes his opinion, we know where he is today. But he so desperately wanted to live forever that he was willing to pay $400,000, an article I read said, $400,000 to preserve his body for the possibility that one day science might be able to revive his brain. Now, you and I might say that's ridiculous. That's a waste of money. But for someone that doesn't have Christ, what is $400,000 to them? If there's a possibility that I could be re, you know, re, put my, my brain in a new body, I might be able to live forever one day, why not? Why not do that? But for those of us who know Jesus Christ, we have everything. We don't have to worry about tomorrow because we know who holds tomorrow, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you don't have Christ, can I encourage you today to call out to him, and ask him to save you from your sin and come into your heart and to give you eternal life in heaven. If you do have Christ this morning, let's be thankful. Let's give thanks to God with a grateful heart for the unspeakable gift that he has given to us. Paul had a passion for souls, and his passion was a result of the generous provision that God had given to him, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, I I thank you for all that you've done for us. And you tell us in your word, That if anyone would call upon the name of the Lord, they could be saved. And so, Lord, I pray today if there's someone who doesn't know you as their Savior, that right now, that they would call out to you and say, I know that I'm a sinner and I deserve the judgment of God in hell. But, Lord, I realize that you died on the cross for my sin. And that today, Lord, the best that they know how, that they would call out to you and ask you to save them and give them a home in heaven for all of eternity. For those of us, Lord, who know you, I pray that today would be a day of thanksgiving as we thank the Lord for our spouse and we thank the Lord for the loved ones that we have in our life. Oh, Lord, I pray that we would not forget how much you went through when you were accursed on that cross for us. And may we always be grateful and always be thankful. No matter what happens, we could lose our health, we could lose our wealth, we could lose our life. But if we have Jesus, we have everything. Thank you, Lord, for that gift.